Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, I love the sound, all of you sitting down at the same time. Uh, that's kind of fun. Uh, my name is Dave Campbell. Uh, I get to serve as the lead pastor at Invitation Church in uh, Trinity. We just wanted uh, just to have a moment just to say uh, a thank you uh, for being uh, so good to us. You may or may not know uh, that we uh, moved in, and so in January, uh, we began uh, gathering in the FLC at uh, 4.30 in the afternoon, and it's been a great gift to us. And so I just want to say uh, thank you for being uh, such great hosts um, and ministry partners. And today's kind of a neat day uh, that we all get to gather uh, together and celebrate and speak resurrection. Uh, in the World War II era, uh, there was a Lutheran theologian named Diedrich Bonhoeffer, and he wrote something about resurrection that I want to read uh, for us. He said that God is not simply a stopgap for the holes in our knowledge of the world, nor is he merely the source of ultimate answers to personal and human problems. In other words, God's not simply the one whom we reach when we are extended to our own limits. He is, on the contrary, the ground and the center of our existence. And, through, and though we may conceive ourselves as going to him and reaching out to him beyond the sphere of our everyday existence, we nevertheless start from him and remain in him as the very ground of our existence and our reality. Will you pray with me? God, we are grateful people this morning because you are alive, uh, because you have spoken into death's curse, into sin's curse, into hell's curse, and you have spoken that because you live, we also will live. And so, God, we claim not just that resurrection has happened, but that resurrection is happening. We see it as a work of creation, that as you spoke into the chaos order, as you spoke into the darkness light, as you spoke into the formlessness form, so too today do you have words to speak. And these are resurrection words with resurrection power. And the whole day is wrapped in your grace. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, something that we do uh, around invitation is we have a space uh, for kids uh, to hang out. And so in addition to the nursery, we have a group of kindergarten through second grade and a group of third through fifth. And so if there's training kids today and an Easter egg hunt sounds fun to you, I'm not sure. All the adults are staying in the room. Uh, but <laughs> if you're a kid and you would like to participate in that, uh, our kids team is going to be in the hallway. And we would love to welcome you for you to be a part of that. So you can stand up right now. Uh, to ask your parents first. Um, but to go and just to celebrate, have some time uh, together. And then parents, after the service, just make sure to find your person <laughs> that belongs to you. Uh, that, would, that would be great. Awesome. That's the sound of joy exiting the room today. Awesome. Hey, I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, uh, which is uh, the verse that uh, Matt is preaching about today. Uh, it's, a, it's a great gift to, to gather with you. Matt and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, we met in our early 20s, and we're no longer in our early 20s, and so... Uh, <laughs> It's just been a, it's been a gift uh, to do ministry. We did youth ministry together uh, for a season, and uh, it's probably best. That season didn't last for a super long time. We needed supervision in those years uh, for sure. Um, but as just a thank you to the Trinity staff, uh, Matt and Dave and Murr and Annie and Philip. Uh, Matt, we just come up just for a second? We just have a small gift um, it would be uh, our hope um, that you would uh, enjoy a staff dinner at Grill 26. Um, we just wanted to just have a, a way to say thank you for the way you welcomed us and partnered uh, with us. And so can we say thank you to the Trinity staff? That'd be amazing. Yeah. 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 
My only request is that you get dessert, all right? So, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes these words, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, but because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And this grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you today for this word. We thank you for Matt and the gift uh, that he is to this local church, but also to this community. Uh, We thank you for the vision you have given him, for the faithfulness in which he has served in this city for a long time, and we are grateful uh, today as partners with him uh, to hear your words uh, that you will take up and that you will use to bear good, lasting, and deep kingdom fruit in Jesus' name and for Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks, Dave. Um, I appreciate um, Dave as well. I was thinking through all the stories as uh, he mentioned. Uh, we go back um, serving at uh, Oak Hills Baptist and Youth Ministry, uh, and that we probably needed some supervision. I think of uh, holding a Sunday school lesson on the roof without asking anyone, <laughs> and uh, uh, several people coming. And uh, thankfully, uh, I think Dave fielded most of those questions. Uh, I was up on the roof. I, I, I don't know. Um, so, so I remember that story. I remember when I first came to Trinity, um, and uh, I was preaching in the Family Life Center. And right where the stage is now, there were some doors there. It was a storage unit. And uh, Dave and I were helping with an event, Chaos. And uh, all the, the guys stayed here. And Dave and I had a, a blow-up mattress that we were sharing together. And uh, throughout the night, we just would continually lose it <laughs> because kids would not stop talking. Uh, um, and then um, the other memory that comes to mind is we took a trip when, uh, uh, when we were at Oak Hills to uh, Estes Park. And uh, it provided a lifetime's worth of sermon illustrations. Uh, one of them uh, happened right away. We get into one of the vans, and uh, GPS is turned on, and as we're going, um, we're we're starting at Oak Hills, and we're going down Minnesota, and we get to about where the interstate is, and we go right past it, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure (laughs) if if I had to guess where we should be going, it should be on the interstate, but instead, we go around the interstate, then we make our way over, somehow we get down to Nebraska without the interstate, and now we're on all these back roads, and I'm like, what? Uh, like, we're both like, why is it taking us here? But we're like, I don't know, it's GPS, so you just kind of follow what it says. And so we continue to go down all these weird roads, and we finally get there, and we realize that the GPS was set to avoid interstate. <laughs> so at the very core, <laughs> at the very core of the thing that ought to be guiding us, it was off, and we didn't, we didn't know it. And as a result, we're going through all this weird stuff because we, did, we didn't double check the core. And I, I, think that's what, I think that's what Paul wants to do in this passage. He's inviting us to take a second look 
at the core of what's guiding us. And he's writing to the Corinthian church. Now, uh, at Trinity, we've been going through um, Paul's letter to the Corinthian. What we, f- what we found is, uh, and I've heard it described before, is the, the church in Corinth is essentially a dumpster fire. It is a mess. Um, there's all sorts of things that are going wrong in this congregation. Uh, we see that uh, there is a ton of divisiveness. So imagine, imagine a form of Christianity that is highly divisive. I know, just try to stretch your imagination. <laughs> Uh, A form of Christianity that is addicted to worldly forms of power. A kind of Christianity uh, that is uh, primarily arrogant and lacks humility. A kind of Christianity uh, that uh, judges the world's sin but will not confess its own. Uh, A kind of Christianity that abuses freedom in the sense that it insists on its own freedom to do what it wants, but it won't surrender and use its freedom in service to others. Imagine a Christianity that has decentralized love and placed it on the periphery. Imagine a Christianity that wonders uh, if the resurrection even matters. This, this is the Corinthian church, and Paul is writing to them, and again and again what he does is he says, let's take a look at the core. <laughs> let, me, let me bring you back and make sure that you're rooted in uh, what is of first importance. And, and if, you, if you sink your roots into that, that should provide a trajectory that should not lead to any of this. And, and if you find this, it might be that something is off with the core. If you're going down these dirt roads of of the Christian life, and and somehow you've worked Christ into a divisive, worldly power, arrogant, um, obsessed with other people's uh, shortcomings, but but, uh, neglecting our own, this abuse of freedom. If if that's happening, then maybe what needs to happen is we need to recalibrate and say, what is at the core? And so the Apostle Paul does that, and he says, what I want to do is I want to remind you of the gospel I want to remind you of the gospel. And so the word gospel literally means good news, right? It, it, it's, it's the same word. So gospel and good news. We're saying the same thing. And Paul says, if we want to get to the core, let's revisit what the gospel is. In fact, he not only says, I want to remind you of the gospel, and then he says that I preach to you, but that word preach there is that I gospelized to you. So I want to remind you of the gospel I gospeled to you. And he says, this gospel is a firm foundation. It's, it's the thing that I preached. It's the thing that you first received. It's, it's the thing that you stand upon. And it's the thing that has power to renew you and is in the process of renewing you. And so, what is Paul talking about? The gospel that I gospeled to you, if you hold fast to the gospel. What's he talking about? The gospel right? So, so he's saying at the core is the gospel, but then the question is, what in the world is the gospel? What in the world is the gospel? Now, when I first heard the word gospel, I was given a certain meaning and had received that meaning and thought, that is what the gospel is. And for me, the gospel went like this. And so this is a popular form. Maybe you've, you've heard it too. The popular gospel is that God created you and has a wonderful plan for your life, right? Secondly, that although God created you and has a wonderful plan for your life, that you have sinned and you have fallen short of the glory of God. And so we're like, oh no, this is not good. So then you get to the third step. Jesus Christ died for you. And then there's all sorts of mixtures on the last step, but a common one is that if you trust this to be true, which uh, essentially in a lot of forms of it is if you just agree with that this happened, then you can go to heaven when you die. And and this is is what I had heard the gospel was, and this is uh, what uh, I had taught the gospel was. Uh, But then I started to read again and again the Bible, and I started to see, wait a second, Um, although I think there's truth 
in these statements. The question is, is that the core? And is that, is that what the Bible calls the gospel? I think of an email exchange that happened between a New Testament scholar by the name of Scott McKnight and a pastor by the name of Eric. And they were asking that question, what is the gospel? And for Pastor Eric, this gospel was the gospel. And so they were going back and forth. Eric said to Scott McKnight, the gospel is about our sins, Jesus as Savior, and our need to believe by accepting him into our heart. So Scott pushed back. He said, did Jesus preach that gospel? If you're wondering, Mark 1.15. Jesus came and proclaimed the gospel, that the kingdom of God was drawing near and had drawn near. So the response is repent, which means rethink everything. The word for repent is metanoia. It's a change of mind. Rethink everything and believe, which is not just agree with, but it's like trust and give your full allegiance over to this way. His response, though, shocked Scott. This pastor said, no, Jesus didn't preach that gospel. Before I could say another word, he sent me another email. He said, the gospel is not about Jesus as Lord, about being a disciple of Jesus, about the kingdom vision for social justice and changing the world. It's about three things, admitting you're a sinner, understanding Jesus as the Savior on the cross, and believing that by consciously accepting him as Savior, So the gospel is about grace, so anyone who pushes for kingdom, repentance, and following Jesus is pushing into the realms of works. Interesting. Pastor Eric used the word gospel, Scott McKnight used the word gospel, but they had different ideas as to what that meant. So then, what is the gospel that Paul wants to pass on? As we look at it, we see this. He says, here's, here's the, the, of core importance, the gospel, the good news that I proclaim to you. And it's this, that Christ died according to the scriptures. That Christ was buried. That Christ was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that Christ appeared to all sorts of people. Right, we, we hear of Peter and James. Paul says that uh, the risen Christ appeared to over 500 people, some of whom are still living. So if the Corinthians are having questions about whether the resurrection happened and some of them are still living, he's like, just ask around. You're going to find somebody uh, who, is, who has been a witness to this. Now, if, if you look at these Gospels side by side, um, you'll notice that in the first Gospel... Uh, there's a primary character, and uh, that first gospel is primarily a story about you. That God created you, that you have sinned, that Jesus died for you, that you can go to heaven. The gospel centers around you. Now, in that gospel, Jesus has a role in it. He comes and sets things right, and then if, if that's the only role that Jesus plays, then after you receive him, And after you agree that he died for you, well, then why does the resurrection matter? And what about all the other teachings of Jesus? And what about his announcement that a kingdom, the kingdom of God was breaking into this world? Where does all that fit? But if you look at the story that Paul tells, again and again, it's primarily Christ, 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 Christ. It's a story of Jesus. The gospel, at the center of the gospel, is the story of Jesus. And Jesus is is the fulfillment of the scriptures. Jesus is not just one character in the scriptures that he came and he fixed something uh, like like a plumber. If you call a plumber... And and they come to your house and they fix something... And then they don't say, all right, I'm staying here now. They, They usually, you say, all right, you fixed it, thanks. And they leave. But this is not what Jesus has done... And this is not the good news that he came and fixed it, and now we say, all right, we're good to go, and we can just go back to doing things uh, as we've done them uh, for, for the rest of our lives, but now we know that after death, um, we can get to heaven. No, the, the story about Jesus is that Jesus has become king. 
Jesus has become king. In fact, that's what the word Christ means, right? Christ is not Jesus' last name. You remember back when there were phone books <laughs> and those were things? Uh, you wouldn't find, uh, if you're trying to call Jesus, you wouldn't look under the C-section. It's not C-section. Oh, my goodness. What a pun. <laughs> huh. Okay, you wouldn't look in the C area? Um, <laughs> Because it's not his last name, it's a title, and, and it means the anointed one in, in Greek. If you want to say anointed one in Hebrew, it's Messiah. They're the same word, they're just in different languages. But both of them are referring to the kingship of Jesus, that Jesus has become king, that he in himself was, was the portal by which God's kingdom was coming to earth as it is in heaven. In fact, that's what Jesus taught us to pray, right? The Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's this movement from heaven to earth. And, and Jesus is the one who makes that happen. It is through Jesus that all the life of, of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God come flowing into this world. And, and when we understand it's a story about Jesus, and par particularly, Paul wants to emphasize the resurrection. Now, it's the whole story of Jesus, but if they're doubting the resurrection, he's going to center on that. But the resurrection, for Paul, says, this is a game changer. This, this is not just some little thing. It, it matters a ton. And so what do we mean when we talk about the resurrection? I remember one time visiting uh, a woman who... Uh, was, she was grieving the loss of her mother and was, uh, she was planning uh, for the funeral. And she was searching through the scriptures for words of comfort. And she came to 1 Corinthians 15 and she asked the question. She said, I saw in here that it said the dead will be raised. And I'm kind of confused about that. Because aren't the dead just raised right when they die up to heaven? Now, when we hear the word resurrection... And when we hear about being raised, it's important what comes to our mind. For us and for this woman, a lot of times what we tend to think is that resurrection and being raised means after we die, it's the process of going to be with Jesus. Now, that's a good promise, and nothing can separate us from the love of God, that, that uh, even death itself does not separate us from, from him. So we don't have to fear that. But when the Bible talks about resurrection, it's not talking about that part. Instead, it's talking about this part. It's talking about spirit and soil coming together again as God made it in the beginning. It's about a new body that will not perish, spoil, or fade. It's not a story about going to heaven, but about heaven coming to us. Or as, as some Christians have put it, the primary story of the Bible is not about how to get into heaven, but about how to get heaven into us and into this world. And that changes the story. Right? It, it changes the story from what we've often told ourselves, that, that the good news of the Bible is not an escape strategy, but an entrance of the kingdom of God into this world. That, that changes everything. If, if the good news of Jesus is about God's life and love and way of being flowing into the world, then what does it mean to trust in Jesus? It's not just saying, well, I believe he did something and now I'm just going to continue to do everything as I've normally done them, but hopefully with a blessing from Jesus. No, no. It's an invitation into the very life and way of God. And that that has opened up to us. The, the, the resurrection is something that the people of God, the Jewish people, not all of them, uh, but several of them were looking forward to. And the resurrection, the, the belief in it was not that one guy would be raised uh, by himself. The belief was that everybody would be raised from the dead and then they would face the, the judgment of God or the proclamation of God or the setting right of the world. And so they were looking forward to a time when God would raise all the dead. 
So what's weird is when Jesus is raised ahead of everybody else, it's, it's, it's a proclamation that the future has started, that the end is now, that where God is taking the world, it's possible right in the present. And, and when we start to realize that, and then we start to go through life differently. I mean, have you ever taped, uh, taped, recorded now, I suppose the phrase would be, uh, we're no longer in our young 20s. Um, <laughs> have you ever recorded a uh, sporting event, some type of game, and, uh, and you hear that uh, your team won? And then you still want to go back and you still want to watch it. Uh, in that moment, you watch the game very differently. right? If you know how things turn out, th- then... Everything that's happening, you can, you can come into it with a, a non-anxious presence of having to yell at your TV, right? You, you, can, you can come into it in a very different way. But, but if you don't know, <laughs> if you don't know where things are going, if you're not confident that that, that team uh, has a victory in the end, then you're just like, you're on the edge of your seat the, the whole time. The good news of Jesus is that God's future has come to us. That that where God is taking the world has opened up to us in the person of Jesus. And and as we trust in him, and as we continue to come to him and center and ground our life in him, it it can renew everything. I mean, we can have a non-anxious, non-combatant form of Christianity in the world. Wouldn't that be amazing? Because why? Why? God raises the dead. How, how could Jesus, how could Jesus resist the temptation of Peter to cut off his enemy's ear, even though Jesus wasn't aiming for an ear? How, how, could, Jesus, how could Jesus resist such a thing? Well, how, could, how could Jesus rebuke James and John, who wanted to call down fire from heaven on their enemies, the Samaritans, because they were mistreated? How, How in the world? Unless Jesus thought that the way the kingdom of God comes is not over and against in a a conquering form, but comes under and below. And even as we live out the way of God in humble service and hold on to the power of love, if we trust that and believe that God will vindicate that, well, then we can enter into it. It's not easy. Jesus weeps. Jesus Uh, Jesus uh, has uh, long prayer sessions with God about this. So it's not easy, but it can allow us to treat one another differently. If we believe that God vindicates and raises the dead. So this this story can can help us in, in all sorts of things we do. And when we trust, when we trust that God will raise the dead, it has all sorts of implications. Even though the, the gospel that Paul tells is not about us, it definitely impacts us. In the same way that if you were at work and someone came into your office, if, if you have an office, they come in and they say, hey, just wanted to let you know um, your coworker just became boss. And then what you wouldn't say is, well, did I become boss? No. Then why do I care? <laughs> Uh, because even though the news of there's a new boss comes to you and it's not about you, it, it has effects on everything you do. And if Jesus Christ is Lord, if Jesus Christ is King, and we know that, how do we know that? Because God raised Jesus from the dead. If that's true, then there's a new person in charge of all the world. There's a king above all other kings. There's a Lord above all other lords. And, and that's, that's a game changer. And it's a game changer for so many reasons. It's a game changer not only because God has won a victory, but it's a game changer because of how he has won the victory. When we think of the resurrection and and God raising the dead, a lot of times we say, oh, good, we can get this cross stuff behind us, and now we have the power of God. Jesus uh, served as our bridge, and now we just go about having the power of God and ruling over the world. And, And if that's what we do with the resurrection, I think it's a mistake. The resurrection not only shows that Jesus is king, the resurrection says, hey, you better go take a second look at what happened on the cross. And you better rethink everything you think about power. 
And so the Apostle Paul had to do that. As he encountered the risen Lord, he had to go back and and he was hunting down Christians and, and he was living out the power of this world over and against and hunting down others. And then he, he was confronted by the risen Jesus and he had to rethink everything. And eventually he would write to the Colossian church that although he thought the cross was the defeat of Jesus, he now sees it as the single greatest victory of God in the world. He says this to the Colossians. He says, Jesus Christ on the cross trampled over the powers and principalities, making a public spectacle of them. You say, what? See, to everyone, as they saw Jesus being crucified, they said, he's losing. (laughs) And yet, the Apostle Paul says, if we believe that God raised the crucified one from the dead, then that means his way of ruling the world is cross-shaped power. It is love that he has embraced, that he went down loving rather than fighting, and God raising him from the dead was saying, that's it. That's how you rule the world. (laughs) You rule the world not by lording it over others, but by coming under others and serving them and loving them, even at, at cost to yourself. You give of yourself, and and when when we live under this rule and reign, and and people are doing that together, it bears witness to a new kind of power, that the love of God displayed on the cross is the power of God. So we hear uh, one theologian say that the cross is not a barrier or a hurdle on the way to the kingdom of God. In fact, it's not simply the way to the kingdom of God. It's what it looks like when the kingdom of God comes. It's what it looks like. It's a a different way of power. And so this is what the resurrection means to us. It means that there's a new king, and he rules by the power of love, and he rules by the power of the cross, and self-giving, other-serving, humble, gentle love God has vindicated And this whole story is not about us getting out of here, but that kind of power flowing through Jesus into us and into the world. That is good news. That's gospel. That that is what we're, that's what we're invited into. And that gets me excited. (laughs) I I think it should get all of us excited. If, If this is what God is doing, then when we come together to Easter, we're not just simply saying, we're going to get some good ham today. What we're, what we're going to say is that God's love and God's life and God's kingdom has flooded the earth through the person of Jesus. And as we trust in him and follow him and surrender our way to his way, what happens is we become a portal through which that life flows into the world. Have you ever seen somebody waiting at a door that they, they thought was a push door and they gave it a few pushes? Well, I guess I'll be out here. And then somebody comes from the inside and they go, uh. (laughs) And they're like, oh, (laughs) it opens the other way. This is is the good news of Easter. A lot of of us have been like, we're trying to get (laughs) in. And we're just like, well, I guess I'll just wait until the door opens. And Jesus comes and says, here, let me me get that. (laughs) If it opens this way. And the vision at the end of the Bible is, I saw a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride, beautifully prepared for her husband. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any chaos of the sea. And there's no tears or crying or pain for the old order is passing away. And the life of the kingdom of God is flooding into the world. This is where the world is going. And so can we rejoice and, and, and Praise God that he has opened up the life of heaven. Can we we praise him? Say amen. 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 And that's a reality for us. So would you continue to trust him? Would you continue to sit with him? Because there's lots of things in us, just like the Corinthian church, that that don't actually trust that the way of Jesus is the power of God. We don't actually uh, trust that that this is what it looks like to change the world. We, we don't actually trust that, that maybe even God raises the dead, so we go about things all different. But God says, no, here's the gospel. Here's the good news. 
The life of the kingdom of God has come in the resurrection of the person of Jesus. A new world has opened up. Will you trust and believe? Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you that Paul saw this come flooding into his life. That as he hunted down those who he thought opposed his way, he was met not with the same, but with the word brother. He was met with the gracious love of your kingdom, and it renewed him to the core. And he traveled the world proclaiming that the kingdom of God had come in the person of Jesus and that it could come in our lives as well. Lord, we open up ourselves to you and your ways. We trust that there is good news in the person of Jesus. May we proclaim his beauty. May we proclaim his life. May we proclaim his teachings. And may we find new creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.